Folks, here, here's the Kennedy assassination in a nutshell. If you have blind faith and confidence in the federal government of the United States, then you believe the evidence that they present to you. And I'll be the first to admit that it's pretty incriminating against Lee Harvey Oswald. But once you begin to look closer, and if you, if you even have a little bit of distrust about the federal government, and after all, that's the same government that told you there was light at the end of the tunnel in Vietnam, and there's weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and uh, read my lips, no new taxes, and oh yeah, if you like your health care plan, you'll keep your health care plan. <laughs> So if you have any doubts about what the government may tell you, and obviously Posner does not, but uh, if you do, then you're going to question what's going on. Uh, what, briefly, I, I could go in, I could refute virtually everything that uh, Posner said, but I'll just start with his description of Dr. Renatus Hertogs, who he goes into great length quoting from some report that Hertog said Oswald was a malcontent and perfectly capable of killing the president and yada, yada, yada. And yes, he said that, but only after he was briefed and uh, instructed by the federal government and federal officers. If you'll go back and actually read his testimony to the Warren Commission, when they first approached him, he couldn't even remember Lee Harvey Oswald. He couldn't remember him, and then he went and dug up and finally found his report where he said, well, this is a sharp kid. He's just, you know, needs a little structure in his life and everything. And it was only long after the assassination and after the government got through with him that he decided that he was, uh, you know, antisocial and malcontent and certainly capable of killing the president. And then from then on, uh, through the rest of uh, what the government told him, and then what he's telling us today is, and then Oswald killed Officer Tibbet, and Oswald did this, and Oswald got his rifle, and Oswald found his palm prints on, on bookcases there in the depository. Well, yeah, he worked there. And by all accounts, he was moving boxes that morning up on the sixth floor. It would have been really strange if they had not found his fingerprints on boxes up on the sixth floor. Uh, I could go on and on. Then he goes into how he killed Tippett. Well, number one, there were at least three witnesses, including the assistant manager of the Texas Hotel, Texas Theater, and uh, Butch, Butch Burroughs, uh, a TV evangelist named Jack Davis, and an insurance salesman, all of whom encountered Oswald inside the theater at the time the policeman was being killed. So he was nowhere around. Uh, they told about the, uh, him running into his rooming house. What they didn't tell you was, and what Mrs. Roberts testified to, was that right after Oswald showed up, a police car pulled up out front, and they hit the horn, beep, beep, and then the car, car pulled down towards Zang, and here comes Oswald hustling out of his room. And then both of them made mention of the fact that on this bright, warm fall day, uh, no one, not one person, could they find who saw Oswald running or walking from his rooming house to the location of 10th and Patton, all right? Nobody. And uh, how'd he get there? All right. I submit to you, he's probably driven there in the police car. And the police car took him to the Texas theater. And we happen to know that uh, after he dropped Oswald off at the theater, Officer Tippett stopped at the Big Town Record Store across Jefferson and uh, ran in to use the phone because they said he came in, tried to use the phone, couldn't raise anybody, and ran back out, got in his car, drove around, made a right, hit uh, hit 10th, went up to Patton, and that's where he got killed up there, okay? And we know this because the uh, Dallas dispatcher tried to raise him on the radio a little after one, and he didn't answer. That's because he was out of the car. I could go on and on. The pistol that Oswald had, he pulled it in the theater, and it snapped. Officer McDonald, the first one to him, said he grabbed his hand, he shoved the pistol into his stomach, and he heard the gun snap, but it didn't go off. And he remembered thinking, boy, am I lucky it didn't go off. Well, the FBI, buried in the minutiae of the Warren Report, said uh, they, they had a bent firing pin or a defective firing pin, and that 38 would wouldn't fire, and they had to repair the pistol before it would work. Well, wait a minute. If it wouldn't fire in the theater, how could it have fired and killed Tippett? He didn't kill Tippett, okay? And then there's the whole thing about the shell casings and the different types of shells. Again, if you trust the evidence as presented to you, it seems Oswald's guilty. But let's take a look. All right, slide. Here's all you need to know. You've got fabrication of evidence, suppression of evidence, alteration of evidence, destruction of evidence, intimidation of witnesses. Slide. 
Fabrication of evidence, slide. All right. On Monday night, Henry Wade at a press conference says, uh, have I mentioned we got his fingerprints on the rifle? Well, that pretty well sealed it for most everyone. Oswald did it, had his fingerprints on the rifle. Except that night, the FBI quite illegally and with no jurisdiction uh, because of pr pressure from Washington through President Johnson and his aide, uh, Cliff Carter, pressured the Dallas police into turning over all of the evidence they had in the assassination to the FBI. And it was shipped up to Washington that night. The next day, in this document signed by Jagger Hoover, it says no latent prints of fingerprints were found on the rifle or even the inner parts of the rifle. Slide. On Sunday, Oswald's killed, and that evening the rifle is shipped back to Dallas. We have the documents. On Monday morning in this old Fort Worth press article, we find an FBI team with a crime lab kit spent a long time in the morgue. Vincent Drain and Harrison, these two FBI agents, carried the rifle over to Miller Funeral Home. Paul Grudy, the funeral home director, told me personally years ago and up to two years ago publicly that he was there and saw him, witnessed him, put Oswald's dead hand on the rifle. In fact, they said they had, he had a heck of a time getting that black fingerprint ink off of Oswald's dead hand in order in time to bury him that afternoon. Fabricated evidence, slide. Here's Paul Grudy, and he said uh, what I just told you. <laughs> slide. Okay, they, the Dallas Police evidence sheet and the photographs originally showed they had only found two spent 6.5 cartridges in the school book depository. But, of course, they wanted to have three shots, so a few days later, this third shell casing shows up. Um, and they said uh, um, that uh, this was carried around in the pocket of a policeman who didn't realize he had really important evidence, you know, so it just suddenly turns up. You notice what the three errors are. They, they said there were these two spent cartridges they found plus one that was loaded in the rifle. You notice there's a little dent on the shoulder of the cartridge. That was a peculiarity of Oswald's rifle. When you slam the, the cartridge into the chamber there, it made a little dent on the, on the shoulder of the cartridge. Well, the third shell casing that suddenly showed up and was unaccounted for, it does not have that dent. That was never loaded in the Oswald rifle. This is fabrication of evidence. Slide. Uh, now, you've got two off do documents here. They look absolutely the same FBI reports, same file number, same name, agent drain, same date. And one of them that uh, came out in 1968 says that the pa wrapping paper at the school book depository matched the paper they said Oswald had used as a gun case to smuggle the rifle into the depository. Well, that's incriminating. But oops, over here in 1980, among thousands of FBI documents suddenly dumped out under Freedom of Information Act, we get the exact same looking document, but this says the paper did not match the paper. Well, this is, you know, uh, that uh, shows uh, Oswald might not have gotten the paper from the depository. And when the FBI was asked, well, now, wh which one of these are correct? He said, well, oh, well, the one that was released from FBI files in 1980, that's a fake document. Well, how many other fake documents are in FBI files? Slide. Now, the two funeral home, the two naval technicians, Gerald Custer, who took the autopsy x-rays of, of President Kennedy, and Floyd Reby, who took the autopsy photographs of President Kennedy. Not conspiracy theorists, not authors trying to sell a book. These are the technicians that took the photographs and x-rays, and they are on the record saying, and you didn't hear about this because it didn't go very, very far, the x-rays that the National Archives are now showing us and the um, photographs are fakes, phonies, not the ones we took. Fabrication of evidence. Slide. Uh, okay, this is where he said there was no damage to the face. This, the skull shows a whole missing side of the head. Fake photographs, fake. Uh, Reby said they're phony, not the photographs we took. Slide. And this, of course, is what you're expected to believe, that this one bullet uh, comes from 60 feet in the air, strikes Kennedy in the back at the third thoracic vertebra, 
uh, below the shoulder blade, somehow courses upward without hitting a bone, exits out the front of his throat at an upward trajectory, somehow twists in midair, goes back down to strike Connolly near the right armpit, shatters his fifth rib, exits through his right chest, shatters his wrist bone on his right hand, that dense bone, and then ends up in his left thigh, all by one bullet, slide. And if that's not zany enough, they said, this is the bullet that did it. How many of y'all fired into a beer can? How many of y'all fired into anything? You know, it distorts bullets. You don't get one like this, all right? Now, here's the proof. This is Governor Connolly's x-ray that was made public. And you can see where the wrist bone, the dense bone, was broken by the bullet and where they repaired it. And you can see the bright spots. There's more pieces of metal that was still in Connolly's body when they buried him than is missing from the bullet they say caused the wound. They're just lying to you, okay? And that little chip up at the top, that's where the FBI chipped off a little piece for spectrographic analysis to, uh, the, to analyze the, uh, the, the, the com composition of the metal in the bullet, and we still do not have the results of those tests. All we have is a letter from Jagger Hoover to the Warren Commission saying, well, the, the bullet and fragments and fragments in the car, uh, they're similar. Similar. That's like saying the woman is just a little bit pregnant, okay? They're either identical, which means they come from the same ammunition, or they're not, which means they came from different ammunition. Again, they're lying to you. Uh, uh, slide. Okay, alteration of evidence. Slide. All right, this gets technical, so I'm just going to go on. But this is I'm trying to make this quick. This is uh, the uh, sworn test deposition of James C. Cadigan, FBI official. Slide. And uh, in this official testimony, they ask him, do you know why uh, Exhibit 820 was not uh, reprocessed or desilvered? And somebody has scratched out his answer and written, no, this is a latent fingerprint matter. And then it's kind of off the screen over here. But over here, they wrote, delete. Okay, uh, slide. So sure enough, in the Warren Commission report that you get to read, they say why A20 was not uh, re reprocessed or desilvered. He said, no, this is a latent fingerprint deal. Somebody altered an official deposition. This is a criminal act. Slide. So what was he trying to, what did they block out? Well, we find later on that he was saying that uh, he was telling them that the FBI on the 23rd, the day after the assassination, when the FBI was not even officially supposed to be on the case, had taken possession of a very large quantity, all of the evidence. Okay, slide. And we find Chief Curry said, yes, said uh, that we got pressure from Washington. They wanted all the evidence in Washington. And Captain Fritz, who was in charge of the investigation, said, well, I need people to identify the gun. I need people to check on this. I need, you know, how can I do this when they're taking away the evidence? He says, but finally we decided as a matter of courtesy to let them have it. And he says, I think that they still have it. And the, the J. Lee Rankin, the uh, uh, chief counsel of the Warren Commission, says, yes, the commission's still working with it. And Curry says, yeah, we never got any of it back. All right, slide. Meanwhile, on November the 27th, on Tuesday after the Friday assassination, finally there was a meeting with the FBI and the Secret Service and the Dallas Police and the Dallas uh, District Attorney. It was decided to ask the FBI into the case. So three days later, finally they become the official uh, investigation, and now there was a few boxes they carried out of the Dallas Police Headquarters. I remember seeing it on local TV, and it became the federal case. What am I telling you? I'm telling you the FBI illegally, surreptitiously, with no chain of evidence, no oversight, had all of the evidence in this case in their hands for three full days. Who knows what they put in? Who knows what they took out? This is why the evidence is so confusing. Slide. This is a picture I took myself before they built the sixth floor. You can't get to this pic window anymore because they've got it plexiglassed off, okay? You can see that's the floor down at the bottom. The f window's only a foot away from the floor. The window was only half open. There's two two-inch pipes on this side of it. It's going to be very difficult to try to kneel or lay down and aim down the street, and yet you can see it through the trees. Um, let's see if this thing's working here. Well, yeah, 
See the highway sign? That's where the first shots hit, right there. What's the problem? He was shooting through a tree, live oak tree. It's still there. This is why you can't get in that window. If you could, you could look down and realize that you can't get a line of sight to the middle of the street. But I'll tell you what you can do, please be careful. But when the light's red and all the traffic stopped, run out there right under that sign where the shots hit, turn around, look up at that sixth floor window, and you won't be able to see it because that tree's in the way. And it's, it's, uh, it was in the tr way then, it's in the way now. That tree's been trimmed back at least three times that I know of, two, two times for TV documentaries and once for the Oliver Stone film. Okay, here's the Dallas Police evidence sheet, uh, the original one. And you can see that they only had two spent shells found. You also see at the bottom the paraffin test made on Oswald was positive on both hands, negative on the face. I have a copy of the test. There were traces of nitrates on Oswald's hands, but no nitrates or gunpowder on his face and no gunpowder on his hands. That's pretty, pretty, pretty good evidence he had not fired a rifle that day. So now the Warren Commission, when they presented this in their Warren report, uh, what do they do? They changed it to reveal that there's three shell casings found, three shots, three shell casings. And instead of explaining the, uh, instead of explaining the paraffin test, they just delete it. They hide it away from you. That's suppression of evidence. Uh, all of the D Dallas doctors talked about the gaping wound in the right rear portion of Kennedy's head. All of them. And they even showed us this picture, though, before any of the autopsy photographs became known. And they said that was the bullet hole, a little bitty hole in the back of his head. And then, oh, you can see the whole back end of his head looks perfectly okay, but actually kind of looks painted in. And then when the actual photographs autopsies came out, we found out that that wasn't a bullet hole at all. It's just a piece of dried blood or something. Commander Humes, the autopsy doctor, said, I don't know what that is. It could be dried blood. You can see through it. So, again, they're just lying to you. The autopsy clearly states that his wound was at the third thoracic vertebra, but below the shoulder blades to the right of the backbone. And on the evidence of the face sheet of the autopsy, again, we find that, yes, this wound in the back is located in the back, not in the neck. And uh, this is one is presented by the Warren Commission, and they tried to argue that, well, it's not, it's not accurate. Uh, it, that was just a rough sketch. It actually was much higher up on the neck. And yet we read in the original one before they deleted it that it says verified Dr. George Berkeley, Kennedy's personal physician, who was there with him in Dallas, who was there at the hospital, who was there at the autopsy. And do you know, was he asked to testify to the Warren Commission? No. Now, here's his jacket, and there's the bullet hole, third thoracic vertebra, middle of the back. And they said, well, yeah, but he was, he was raising his hand, and he was trying to wave, and his coat rode up, and uh, the bullet hole is actually a lot uh, uh, lower than it actually was. Well, here's his shirt, and it also has the bullet hole the exact same location. Your shirt doesn't rise up just because you're waving. Again, they've been lying to you. All right. And well, all right, we've already done this. Now, here's a good one. Here's the Zapruder film, and this is frame. Um, this is frame 257, and you can see that he's. This is before the headshot, and you can see what a normal uh, shadow on his head should look like. This is frame 317, and look at this big black blob that's been painted in there. Uh, in my new updated version of Crossfire, you'll find there are 11 Hollywood film and, and tape experts who were shown certain frames from the Zapruder film, and they said unanimously that this is a crudely painted on forgery. That the Zapruder film has been doctored. We now know for sure that it was in the hands of the CIA National Photographic in uh, Interpretation Center the day after the assassination and was manipulated before being handed over to Time Life on that Monday. And then, by the way, for all of you old enough to remember, Time Life got it, and we never got to see the film run as a film for 15 years. It was 1975 thanks to the subpoena of Jim Garrison, his uh, prosecution in New Orleans, that we finally got to see the Zapruder film. Now, I threw this one in because I hope you can see this pretty well. This is 314, the headshot. Greer, uh, the driver, is looking right back at Kennedy, contrary to his testimony, which he said he never looked back. 
didn't even know there was an assassination until Kellerman next to him said, we're hit, get us out of here. And at that point, the foot comes off the brake, the brake lights go off, and the car starts moving forward. The, you can see here this bright colored object. This is the top of Kellerman's head. There's his forehead, and there's the top of his greased hair. Back then, all us men wore hair grease on our head, and it reflected the sunlight. You can see the same type of reflection off of Greer's, the back of his head, and you can see that Greer's hands are on the wheels. So when you hear this old, weak conspiracy theory about the driver shot him, it's not true. All right, now I'm just quickly, we see all these computer analysis. Here's my computer analysis. Okay, see, went through the tree, hit a sign, bounced back, hit him in the throat. You know, well, don't laugh, the computer did that. Okay, we all know computer in, computer out, garbage in, garbage out, right? Okay, so every, every uh, computer analysis of the Kennedy assassination has to rely on perfectly accurate data as to the dimensions, depths, trajectories, heights, uh, elevations of Dealey Plaza. And they do this because the Warren Commission hired Dallas County Surveyor Robert West and his associate Chester Brenneman. Uh, Time Life hired him on Monday after the assassination to survey Dealey Plaza. And then later in April of 64, uh, or May, they, the Warren Commission hired them to survey Dilly Plaza. And they found all kinds of interesting stuff. They also showed that uh, this is where the first shots hit and that it, it was hid behind a tree. You couldn't get a line of sight to the sixth floor. They also found a bullet strike on the south side of uh, Elm Street. And they found these odd yellow marks on the curb, which just happened to uh, straddle the exact place where the headshot was. What's that all about, okay? But the key thing is, is that when they, this map was presented to the Warren Commission, they uh, took it all out and they altered their frame numbers, which means that no computer analysis based on the Warren Commission numbers can be accurate because they jimmied with the uh, numbers. Uh, then, of course, we, big deals made out of the picture of Oswald in the backyard. Well, that's him. He did it. There's his rifle. And just like Posner, uh, in February of 64, long before the Warren Commission came out from behind closed doors, they say, Lee Oswald, with the weapons he used to kill President Kennedy and Officer Tibbet. How's that for innocent until proven guilty? Okay? But now let's look at this picture a little closer. We find, number one, that if you look up the, close to his... Uh, Head. There's a line that goes right under his chin. And up here, it looks pretty much like Oswald, but that chin is big, broad, flat chin. Look at Oswald. He had a little old pointy cleft chin. All right? And he told the Dallas police, he said, well, I, 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 Chief um, Fritz said, I showed Oswald a large picture of him holding a rifle, and the picture had been enlarged by the crime lab, and he said the picture was not his, that the face was his face, but that the picture had been... Um, superimpose somebody else on, on his body, okay? Well, wait a minute, is that possible? Okay, if you ta now we know that they, they take the two pictures that they said they found of Oswald in the backyard that were supposed to be taken by a handheld camera on two different occasions, minutes apart, and if you make them into a transparency, nothing should match. Oh, but wait, Oswald's face matches perfectly on both of them. And the little V-shaped shadow under his nose. Even in one, he's got his head tilted. And over here, his head's back this way. But the shadow never moves. This is strong support that Oswald was telling the truth. This is, this is a superimposed picture with his face placed on somebody else's body. And by the way, we now know that there uh, was three pictures. Um, a third picture, a third photograph, ended up in the hands of Geneva White the policeman's wife that Beverly saw him in Dealey Plaza at the time of the shooting, okay? And he told her, keep this, it'll be worth something. And this other photograph shows, him, shows a whole different pose. And yet, did they know about this third photograph? Yes, they did, because the Warren Commission, when they had somebody pose as a reproduction, reenactment of the backyard photograph, they posed in the pose of the third photograph that was never explained and never known for 15 years. Suppression of evidence, all right? We all saw on the Zapruder film that uh, Jackie crawls out on the rear deck of the car, picked up his piece of his head. 
And we know this because Dr. Jenkins talks about how she was shell-shocked and handed him this piece of skull over at Parker Hospital. And yet for years you all have been told, well, she was trying to escape the car. Well, she was trying to help Clint Hill climb on. Yada, yada, yada. Why? Because obviously if a piece of his skull was blown to the rear deck of the car, that indicates a shot from the front. There were missing frames from the Zapruder film, six frames as he goes behind that Stimmons Freeway sign. You haven't heard about this either, but Japanese television found a uh, version of the Zapruder film that the six frames are present. And they had a computer analyzed by both in Poland and in the uh, England. And both of them concurred and said that there was a bullet strike on this sign. So now you got two bullets hitting Kennedy two bullets hitting Connolly, a bullet hitting James Tagg, a bullet hitting the curb, a bullet by the manhole cover, and now you got a bullet that hit this sign. So, you know, there were bullets flying all over the place, just like Beverly was saying. And, again, suppression of evidence. You've got all these people, including Dallas policemen, who encountered men showing Secret Service identification and chasing them away, saying, don't come back here, we got it covered back here, you go on over there and moving people all around, all right? This was duly reported by the Dallas News. It continues to tell you there was nothing else going on, and yet nobody has explained who these people were with Secret Service identification good enough to fool Dallas policemen. All right, here's what I was talking about. There is the third photograph that suddenly turned up after 15 years of Oswald, and did they know about it? Well, here's the commission exhibit 37, and look, they're po using the pose not of the two known photographs, but of the third suppressed photograph, suppression of evidence. Uh, here is Arlen Specter trying to demonstrate his cockamamie single bullet theory that the bullet went through Kennedy's neck and then just kept on head Conley. But you see, they kind of slipped up because they actually marked the bullet mark on this Kennedy stand-in down in the back, closer to where it actually was. So you see he's got to move his little straight edge about six inches over the guy's shoulder to make this trajectory through two men work. They just lied to you. They know better. Now, did they know better? Of course they did. Here's a transcript from the January 27th uh, Warren Commission meeting, and we hear J. Lee Rankin say, well, it seems quite apparent now that since we have a picture of the bullet uh, that went in the back, that bullet that entered the back and uh, didn't hit any bone and uh, came out the shirt in front, and um, you know, and then he says, and so how it could turn, and by then he realizes what he's saying. He's saying he was going to say, how could it turn in midair and go back down and strike Conley? So he realized what he's saying, so he shut up. They knew, they knew as early as January of 64 that this single bullet theory didn't work because the back wound's lower than the throat wound. Well, wait a minute. Maybe that's a whole new conspiracy theory. That's an upper trajectory, isn't it? Maybe there was a gunman hiding in the trunk of the car. Hey, it makes as much sense as the Secret Service agent in the backup car accidentally slipping and shooting him in the back of the head. You know, and they're seriously telling you that on national television. That didn't happen. People were standing there right there watching. If that had happened, somebody would have said so. Destruction of evidence. Here was the Star-Telegram ran a picture of the bullet in the grass near the manhole cover the, that was uh, the next day. And here we have a Dallas policeman and a deputy sheriff are standing there guarding it. This sandy-haired fella picks it up sticks it in his pocket, walks off. Chi Curry published these pictures in his book and said that was an FBI agent. So where did that extraneous bullet go to? Went into the pocket of an FBI agent and it's never been accounted for or explained. Destruction of evidence. Gerald Posner conveniently blocked off the other portion of this picture saying this is a picture of the backyard of General Edwin Walker's house that found in Oswald's possessions and therefore he must have shot at General Walker. Well, wait a minute. When, when it was uh, actually shown uh, in the Dallas police, here's the Dallas police uh, evidence that they collected from Oswald and you notice he had a spy camera, Minox camera, that had a five-digit serial number. Uh, and researchers have checked with Minox Corporation, and we found out that only six-digit serial numbers were commercially available. So Oswald had a spy camera that was not commercially available. Somebody issued it to him. And here, down here, I don't know if you can see this, but here is the photograph of the back of uh, 
Edwin Walker's house, and there's the car. And look, there's, you could read the license plate if you got up close enough. And yet, while it was in the hands of the federal authorities, somebody poked a hole in the license plate. So you couldn't tell who was there, so you couldn't find out what was actually going on. And while I'm on General Walker, because uh, uh, Poser, I mean Posner, uh, made uh, a big deal about that, I interviewed General Walker in the fall of 1964, and he said the police told him that uh, the caliber of rifle used to shoot through his window was a 30 6 Well, Oswald was never known to have a 30 6 um, Walker did not believe that Oswald had taken a shot at him. And he also told me, because this was just a month or two that I interviewed him after the Warren Commission had issued their report, and he said, look, Oswald and Ruby knew each other, just as Beverly told you. He said the whole Warren Commission is going to have to start over just on that one, that one fact alone. That was General Walker. Um, Okay, immediately they begin to clean up the car. See the bucket down here? They were washing off the car, washing down the seats. They put the top on, and under orders of Lyndon Johnson, they had the car sent off, torn down, rebuilt, made armor-plated, put bulletproof glass in it, and destroyed it as forensic evidence. Agent Hosty said that Oswald, a week or two before the assassination, had gone to police, uh, FBI headquarters in Dallas, and had left a note that was styled as a warning, okay? Uh, but uh, after the assassination, uh, J. Gordon Shanklin, the head of the Dallas FBI office, called Hosty in and said, get rid of that note. So he started tearing it up. He said, no, I don't even want it in this office. So he went and flushed it down the drain somewhere. That is blatant destruction of evidence, and I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, if that note had been some kind of warning, they claimed that he was warning, saying he was going to do something bad to the FBI if they didn't leave his wife alone. Well, if he was threatening the FBI, don't you think they would have published that note on the cover of Life magazine to show what kind of a violent, prone individual he was? But no, instead they destroyed this piece of vital evidence. So, intimidation of witnesses. Look at all these witnesses at the hands of the uh, um, Warren Commission. Jean Hill, they took her to a windowless room in Parkland Hospital, and Arlen Specter berated her and terrorized her into trying to say what he wanted her to say. And when she balked, he said, well, we can make you uh, look as crazy as Marguerite Oswald, and you know how crazy she is. We can have you locked away. Um, it just goes on and on. Over here is a whole list of people, very critical witnesses, uh, including Beverly Oliver, who wasn't known at that time. Or I mean, the, the government knew about her, right? But nobody else did, and so she was never questioned by the Warren Commission. And all of these people ignored by the Warren Commission. And these are people that all had important things to say. Now, is this, is, is this, is that the way to conduct investigation? Okay, now quickly, there's even questions over who Oswald was or who the Oswald in Dallas was. And if you think that's crazy, here is a warning note from J. Edgar Hoover himself to the Security Division of the State Department uh, dated 1960, three years before the assassination, in which he says, there is a chance and a, a possibility of an imposter using Lee Harvey Oswald's birth certificate. Please forward any information you may have. So unlike what we were told at the time, which was the government didn't know anything about Oswald, he just kind of slipped between the cracks and nobody paid any attention to him. J. Edgar Hoover personally was aware of Lee Harvey Oswald three years before the assassination. And then you get this picture that says this is Oswald about the time he defected to Russia. Well, it's kind of an odd-looking picture. Look, one of his shoulders seems kind of broad, and the other seems kind of locked, knocked down and skinny, and he's uh, heavily shadowed on one side of his face and then hardly any shadow on the other, and then his, his uh, right eyebrow and mouth seems to have showed signs of retouching. So let's look at this picture even a little closer. You can see where it seems like it's retouched here and here, and we also see that there's a break in the hairline, and when you connect that all the way down through here and split that, you've got a, you look like you've got two similar but different individuals. And this was a common t uh, tactic to um, take two people who look somewhat similar and then 
superimpose their two faces together, and then when they go th through passport control or any kind of uh, inspection, if it's cursory, they go, well, yeah, that looks pretty much like them, and they get on through. Uh, and now you can see in some of the other photographs, too, you can see the split face, that this one looks different than this one. This one looks different from this one. And here in this one, his marine picture, along with the Dallas Oswald. And look, <laughs> this one's, when you match up the eyes, the nose, and the mouth, this one's an inch or two shorter than the guy that went the Marines. I always thought the Marines built men, not knocked them down two inches. In the Marines, he was listed as 5'11". At his autopsy, he was 5'9". Lost two inches there somewhere. So, and if that sounds crazy, then consider J that Jagger Hoover thought there was an imposter uh, using Oswald's identity, and in 1967, his own mother asked for an exclamation of the grave, saying she had questions about the marks and scars on the body, and uh, Paul Grudy, funeral home director, told me that the Secret Service came back to the funeral home uh, about a week or so after the burial and was asking him questions about scars, marks on the body, and one of them finally commented and said, you know, we really don't know who we have in that grave, but you don't get told that, do you? And Okay, so we see suppression of evidence, fabrication of evidence, alteration of evidence, destruction of evidence, intimidation of witnesses. These are all criminal acts, and it all occurred at the federal level. And the two men responsible are his successor, Lyndon Baines Johnson, and his next-door neighbor and old buddy, J. Edgar Hoover, who was in sole charge of the investigation. The Warren Commission lamented the fact that they had no investigators and that they were totally dependent on the FBI to give them the evidence. Can you trust the evidence? No. And, by the way, if you want to tell somebody who is guilty in the assassination, I will name the two men who, in a courtroom, could be found guilty in the assassination, and it's Lyndon Johnson and J. Edgar Hoover. Now, can I prove that those two men ordered or orchestrated the assassination? No, I cannot. But what I can prove beyond any reasonable shadow of a doubt that this, is that these two men took actions to block, thwart, and stop any kind of meaningful, truthful investigation into the assassination. This makes them accessories. Technically, accessories after the fact. And in Texas, we have executed people who are accessories after the fact. Because legally, uh, even though the facts of the case show they didn't shoot anybody, but they hid the gun, or they drove the car, or they were there, they helped cover it up, and under the, our legal system, they are considered just as guilty as the person who pulled the trigger. So I have long since lost interest in how many people were shooting at Kennedy and from what location and how many shots from the Grassy Knoll, how many shots from the Daltech building. These are the guilty parties right here. And it was occurred at the federal level of the United States, and this is what transformed what at that time was merely another Texas homicide into a national coup d'etat. If you don't believe me, listen to Evelyn Lincoln. Everyone know who Evelyn Lincoln was? Just a few hands. You, you, how many people have seen an interview with Evelyn Lincoln? You really have? There's hardly been any interviews with Evelyn Lincoln. That was Kennedy's personal secretary. And why haven't we heard from her? Because in this letter from Evelyn Lincoln, she says, as far as the assassination is concerned, it's my belief that there was a conspiracy because there were those who disliked him and thought the only way to get rid of him was to assassinate him. And these uh, conspirators, in my opinion, were Lyndon Johnson, Jagger Hoover, the Mafia, the CIA, and the Cubans in Florida. Exactly. Now, John J. McCloy, the powerful banker who sat on the Warren Commission and was one of their most powerful and influential members, said early on, it was of paramount importance that we show the world that America is not a banana republic where a government can be changed by conspiracy. Well, folks, I'm here to tell you the sad truth, which is we are just another banana republic. And our government was changed in 1963 by conspiracy. Now, I'm always asked, will we ever know the truth about the Kennedy assassination? And I'm here to tell you, you know the truth right now, and you certainly know it after seeing my presentation. 
The real question, what they're really asking is, will the time come when a federal official will get up at a press conference or in front of the public and go, okay, okay, here's what really happened to Kennedy. Uh-uh, no, that's not gonna happen. Why? Because if they publicly admit that there was a coup in 1963 and that the government of this country was changed and taken over by a violent act, that makes it an illegitimate government took over. And that means every administration since Lyndon Johnson has been based on an illegitimate government. And the lawyers would have a field day. They would try to roll back every law, every regulation, every presidential order, everything. It would be total chaos, and nobody wants to put up with that. So you'll never hear any truth except out of me, and because I'm stupid enough to tell you the emperor does not have any clothes on. Buy my book. <laughs> yeah, a few, a few unabashed uh, plugs here. Before I launch into the program, which is going to be about rule by secrecy, with uh, and for those of you who have read the book, uh, I've got a PowerPoint program here that I hope will uh, make it even be more graphic for you, maybe even uh, more understandable. Plus, I have a very, very important piece of information that is not in rule by secrecy because I did not find this out until after publication. But before we do that, I want to tell you about something that I've recently come up with that to my way of thinking, is a true smoking gun uh, in the field of UFOs. Um, I rec recently completed a, a uh, little documentary, Aurora, the UFO Crash of 1897. Before Roswell, before the Foo Fighters, there was Aurora, and this one actually was documented in the newspapers of the time. Now, <clears throat> you will find an account of Aurora in my book, Alien Agenda. But at that time, I had gone into the old uh, Fort Worth Star-Telegram, into their microfilm, and had uh, many years ago, back about 1973, and had found the story. And like an idiot, I didn't copy the whole thing. I just jotted some notes. I can still remember the memorable line. It said, the pilot, comma, who was not of this world, comma, you know, just like, just like you might as well said, you know, who had red hair. Um, very, very blasé about it. And then later, uh, the, the story I quote in Alien Agenda is the story that I got from the Dallas Morning News, which of course is still in publication. But all I'd had up until about two weeks ago was a copy of the story. And I won't bother you with the story because it's in Alien Agenda and it's been reprinted other places. Now the debunkers cannot say it wasn't in the newspapers at the time because it was. So their argument is that it was just a hoax story and that it was planted there by Judge Proctor who was a little bit saddened because the railroad had bypassed Aurora, which uh, up until about 1897 had been a fairly thriving town in North Texas, and it was kind of dying on the vine, and he was trying to drum up some excitement <coughs> for Aurora. Okay, that's <clears throat> plausible enough, and I certainly paid attention to that. Until about two weeks ago, when I managed to secure a copy of the entire front page of the Dallas Morning News from April the 19th, 1897. Main headlines talking about the great aerial wanderer. There are 16 stories on this front page and every single one of them concerns the large silver cigar shaped object flying over Texas. Now this folks is in the spring of 1897. This is seven years before the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk. This is seven years before the first powered uh, balloon flight in the United States, the California era, and also in 1904. These reports range from the Oklahoma border as far south as Austin, Texas. 
<clears throat> and it's really incredible. Wortham, Fire Freestone County. Captain John A. Lilly, a prominent and respected citizen of this place, a Mexican War veteran, claims that he saw the mysterious airship last night at 9.30. He said it was going straight up. Kind of leaves out a meteor, doesn't it? <laughs> and of course we have the story here about the crash in Aurora. And says the pilot of the ship is supposed to have been the only one on board, and while his remains are badly disfigured, enough of the original has been picked up to show that he was not an inhabitant of this world. I'm telling you folks, this was recorded years ago, and I have, I have some copies of this front page. It's really worth getting. On two occasions, there's an account of where it actually landed and people communicated with the crew. One time they were told that this was a secret invention that had been developed by an inventor in mid-state New York and that he and two assistants had taken off uh, to test it and it was such a success that they soon found themselves over Indiana. So they just kept going <laughs> and ended up in Texas. And they said, well now don't say anything to anybody, don't, don't spread the word about this because uh, when we get everything patented we're going to release this and it's going to revolutionize transportation. But in the same story, from a different place, we have a fellow who says it landed and they told him that they were from the North Pole in a, in a strange and ice-free area up there where uh, their ancestors had settled and that they were developing this technology. Now, an even stranger story, this one to me is a tip-off that something's going on. And this is not in this Dallas paper, but in the old Fort Worth Register. There was a story of a railroad track inspector who was, a, it was getting late in the evening, he was about to turn back and head back to the city when he saw a bright light up ahead and he went up to investigate and he said there was a large silver cigar shaped object sitting on the railroad track and that there was some crewmen around in blue uniforms. And he um, said the captain came up and talked to him and told him that they had had to stop make some repairs to their craft and that uh, not to say anything about this because they were on a secret mission. He said they, uh, the, the craft was full of dynamite and they were going to go bomb Havana. <laughs> now for those of you who were not asleep in history class, you might recall that the Spanish-American War did not begin for another year. And that was only after the mysterious explosion of the battleship Maine in Havana Harbor. So what's going on here? Why, why would somebody a year previously, how did they know we were going to have a war with Cuba, with Spain that included Cuba? This may have to do with what John Spencer, uh, who wrote the UFO Encyclopedia, calls cultural tracking. And this is that the inhabitants of these craft have the ability to mask themselves, cloak themselves, if you will, and give the appearance of the technology at the time. The fellow who was told that this was a device that had been developed in New York State was told that it, uh, it ran by electricity. Well, of course, today that sounds pretty antiquated. But keep in mind, 1897, rural North Texas, they didn't have electricity. Only big cities had electricity. And it was still kind of a new marvel. And uh, there's some support for this argument because early on, back in the 50s, when uh, contactees were first talking about being taken aboard these craft and stuff, they talked about these rotary dials with numbers on them, okay? Because that was our technology. Today, we have people, uh, experiencers and abductees, who say that they've seen these uh, um, LED things like the, like the watches and clocks we have today because now we have that technology. So it's really kind of an interesting aspect of this whole thing. But I wanted to share with you all the story of Aurora because it is becoming more and more documented in the tape about Aurora and, and uh, I apologize this is not a Hollywood production. This was uh, made on less than a shoestring but the information is there, including interviews with people, descendants of uh, people in Wise County who, who were there and observed what was going on. And of course these are available and like I said, you can get a copy of this front page. If you have friends and relatives that are skeptics and said, why there's nothing there, show them the front page of the Dallas Morning News, 1897. Um, one other quick thing, 
I just have to put in a little plug here. I don't have to remind you of the war rattles and the saber rattling that's going on today in regards to uh, Iraq and also North Korea. I'd just like to quote you from President John F. Kennedy. And uh, this was back at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis when people were actually pointing real missiles at the United States. Now, if there was ever an excuse for us to threaten war with somebody, that would have been it. Today, what have they found? A few empty artillery shells and, and some, you know. President Kennedy said, the United States, as the world knows, will never start a war. We do not want a war. We want to build a world of peace where the weak are safe and the strong are just. We labor on, not toward a strategy of annihilation, but toward a strategy of peace. Think about that, folks. How far have we come from a leader who epitomizes peace and the, and the seeking of peace through strength to a leader who says, if you don't like what we want to do, we'll just come kill you. What color is a purple finch? It's red. Okay? Which country makes Panama hats? Ecuador. Where does the term America come from? Ah, oh, some of you all went to the same high school I did. Amerigo Vespucci, the Portuguese navigator, right, uh, whose name became associated with this new world of America. Wrong. Bzz. No. That story came from a monk, German monk, who lived on the Franco-German border back in the 1500s, named Martin Walsemuller. And good old Martin, I don't think he probably ever got more than about 25 miles from his home in his life. But in about 1515, he got access to a printing press. And he wrote a book. And he knew that there was a new world that they called America. And he knew about Amerigo Vespucci. So he said, oh, well, it was named after Amerigo Vespucci. He later retracted that. But we don't get his retracting because it was in the book, and the book keeps going on and takes a life of its own, and this is what we all get taught. Now, the point of this is most of what we think we know, we don't know. And it's wrong. And I just want you to keep that in mind. Because let me tell you something your mind is like a parachute, works better when it's open. <clears throat> All right, now to try to hurry on through this. <clears throat> I do fine until I get up in front of people. I guess you all make me nervous. You notice how nervous I am. Rule by secrecy, the hidden history that connects the Trilateral Commission the Freemasons and the Great Pyramid. Now, I hate going to places where they put up something and then they read it to you. Hey, thank you, I can read just fine. But I do want to read you this first quote and then I'm not going to read you the rest. You can read them for yourself. But this one, I think, tells the story. And this is not a conspiracy theorist. This is not Jim Mars's quote. This is Woodrow Wilson a very powerful insider, an insider who was put into office by men connected to secret societies. He knew what was going on and what did he write? Some of the biggest men in the United States are afraid of somebody. They're afraid of something. They know that there is a power somewhere so organized, so subtle, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive that they better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. How much more do you want, folks? He's trying to tell us what's going on. 
Now what I've done here and what I'm going to present to you all is a synthesization, easy for me to say, synthesization, a, a compilation <laughs> maybe they're landing I don't know. of more than 300 books and what I'm going to be trying to show you today is bringing together two heretofore believed unconnected topics of research and this is going to get interesting in the coming years because most of you have been at this UFO research game for a long time. And when you started off, it was most people just really laughed and snickered at you. Today, some of them still do, but some of them don't. Today, there's a rising and growing acceptance that there's something out there and that we're probably not being told the truth. Oh, boy. Okay, so where we see that the UFO is now gaining acceptance in the, uh, in, in the minds of the public, uh, this uh, Steven Spielberg Taken series, you know, what a deal. I mean, a lot of, uh, a lot of Hollywoodization there, and of course they had to make up some stuff because they had a story, they had to end their story, and the real story hasn't ended, okay? But yet, for those of you who have done your homework, you'll realize that about the first eight episodes of that show is, is fully backed by evidence, by testimony, and by documentation. So the idea of the um, UFO is growing in, in acceptance. Lagging behind is a parallel issue about the control of secret societies and how they tie together and how that they are pushing harder than ever at this very moment for what they call globalization or what you may have heard referred to as the new world order okay it's nothing new about it it's the oldest game on the planet and they're still pushing it so i can see that at some point in the near future these two issues are are going to uh, blend together they're going to meet and we're going to have a whole new paradigm to deal with, so I'm going to give you folks a little leg up. What I, uh, my initial thesis going into Rule by Secrecy was that the secret societies are not isolated groups, that, they're, that they do connect, and in fact connect all the way back through history. And I was right. And you can read all about that. So let's quickly, I'm going to quickly run you through the modern secret societies and how they connect. And I'm going to try to do this as rapidly as possible to get to the really good stuff. And some of you all are going to start saying, well, whoa, what's this got to do with UFOs? Bear with me, and I think you'll find out. We'll start with the Trilateral Commission, which is one of the more recent ones. This was formed in uh, 1973. Uh, by David Rockefeller and one of his henchmen, Zygmunt Brzezinski. Um, and it was obviously an outgrowth, an extension of the even older and more secretive Council on Foreign Relations because David Rockefeller and Brzezinski were both members. All seven original members of the Council on Foreign Relations were members of the, uh, I mean, uh, seven members of the Trilateral Commission were members of the Council on Foreign Relations. So it's safe to say that it was simply a little more open, a little more public, uh, extension of the Council on Foreign Relations. What it also did was, because of its name, Trilateral, which refers to the trilateral nations of uh, Japan at that time to include China now, North America and Europe, the trilateral nations. And uh, so not only was it an effort to uh, have a little bit more open, uh, less secretive organization, but to also to include the Asian economies. Uh, they put out various position papers, and I particularly like the one they issued in 1975, Democracy in Crisis, where they basically said and argued that, you know, there's a little bit too much democracy in the United States, and it's just really not good for business, so uh, maybe we need to curtail that a little bit. 
Now that was 1975, and I asked some of you older folks here about my age, do we have more or less democracy in the United States today? Seems like that uh, they're getting what they want. You, you might also notice, that I found it interesting, the, uh, the logo of the Trilateral Commission looks suspiciously like a stylized swastika. And that may not be my imagination, as you will soon see. Senator Barry Goldwater, in his book, With No Apologies, just flat stated that the Trilateral Commission is intended to be the vehicle for multinational consolidation of the commercial banking interest by seizing control of the political government of the United States. And in fact, that seems to be what exactly is going on right now is a merging of corporate uh, with federal government. Which brings us to George W. Bush. who I call a post-turtle. Some of you say, what's a post-turtle? Well, that's a term we have down in Texas. You're driving down a country road, and you see a turtle perched up on top of a fence post. That's a post-turtle. You know he didn't get there by himself. <laughs> you know somebody put him up to it. <laughs> And you know he can't do anything while he's up there. <laughs> and basically all you want to do is help the poor creature down. <laughs> Post turtle. If it wasn't so serious about what's going on, it really would be pretty laughable. So now that tracks back to the even more secretive Council on Foreign Relations. This was formed in 1921 by a group of people in, in, that were including uh, Colonel House, who was the right-hand man shadow to Woodrow Wilson, and their whole avowed purpose was to educate the American public on the desirability of global government. And why did they feel like they had to do that? Because they had already made their first attempt, the League of Nations, okay? But it didn't work. Why? Because the Senate of the United States said, I'm not sure we're ready to give up our national sovereignty. How many times have you heard the politicians in the last year to talk about sovereignty? They don't talk about it, do they? For that matter, when's the last time you heard a national politician talk, refer to the republic? They don't talk about that much either, do they? And while we're here, let's stop and briefly and I, I, let's explain what I'm talking about here. Oh, all they talk about is democracy. Democracy. God save democracy. We love democracy. The terrorists hate democracy. Well, what is democracy? Democracy is ruled by the majority. What's the primary example of democracy in action? A lynch mob. Okay? Everybody says lynch him, so they do. Folks, this is not what we were handed by our ancestors. This was never intended to be a pure democracy. What we are supposed to have in this country with its constitution, its bill of rights, is a con is a democratic republic. Now what's the difference? In a pure democracy, the lynch mob. Lynch him, okay? You string him up. In a democratic republic, you have to go through a system of laws, checks and balances, courtroom procedure. You have to give the guy a fair trial. There are certain procedures and laws that you have to follow. You have to, he has the right to meet his accuser. He has the right to defense. He has the right to cross-examine the evidence and the, and the uh, witnesses against him. And then if he's found guilty, then you can hang him. Okay? That's what we're supposed to have. And this is not what we have now, is it? Now they can grab you, lock you up, and uh, if they decide, if one man, John Ashcroft, who, who's up until 9-11's whole claim to fame was throwing covers over the bare breast of statues, in Washington, D.C., because he was upset. No, oh, oh. Talk about a boob. I didn't say that. But on his word alone, you can be declared an enemy combatant in hell without trial and without legal representation. They are stripping the liberties that we are guaranteed in this country. And it really is amazing to me because if Osama bin Laden was indeed behind the 9-11 attacks and there's still been no real proof that he is,
but if he was, and if his goal was to destroy a mock democracy and to end our freedoms, he succeeded, hadn't he? But we know that some bearded guy over in a cave somewhere is not responsible for everything that's going on in the world today. Who's responsible are these people who's responsible are these people who have been working at this for hundreds of years. Uh, what's interesting is notice, oops, they just cut the graphic. Can we put the graphic back up real quick? If you'll notice, over here is the CFR logo with the rider on the horse and the Roman, uh, the uh, um, Latin inscription. And over here is a medallion of the ancient Knights Templars. Looks pretty close, doesn't it? Same deal. And the same objectives are going along. They consolidated all of this a long time ago with the formation of the CIA and with the National Security Act of 1947. The National Security Act of 1947 is really what began to sound the death knell for freedom and democracy in this country. It was signed on September the uh, 27th, I believe, of 1947. and. Uh, it's really interesting to see what happened there. Now, most of the uh, things with the National Security Act of 1947, we're all kind of familiar with. We know it separated the uh, Air Force from the Army as a separate branch of service. We know it created uh, the CIA. Uh, we know that it changed the words, uh, the title of the old War Department to the Defense Department, which is a pretty slick public relations move because if you go back and look at that old war department, oh, who wants a war department? But under the old war department, we only fought three wars, Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II. Under the defense department, where we're only going to defend ourselves, yeah, we got Korea, Vietnam, Kosovo, you know, Panama, you know, Grenada, uh, Laos, Cambodia, you know, Colombia, you name it. I think we need to go back to the War Department. <laughs> we didn't have near as many wars. But within these secret societies now, and everybody that's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, or everybody that's a member of the Trilateral Commission, they are not all sinister conspirators who are trying to take over the world, okay? A lot of them are just wannabes, you know? They want to be there. They want to be taken over the world. Or actually, I would describe it this way. Remember when you were in grade school? And the thing you really wanted most out of life was to be able to sit at the table with the cool kids in the lunchroom. Boy, if I could just be with those cool kids, maybe I could get a date for Friday night, you know? That's what you really wanted. Well, these are the people who are globbed on to these secret societies. Most of them are not on the inner core elite. They are just wannabes and they like their, they like to be next to the wealth and the power. Okay? But within each of these societies there is a handful of people that like, and one is David Rockefeller, he's in all of them, okay? Henry Kissinger, you know, there's certain ones who are at the inner core of all of these societies. They meet once a year uh, in a group known as the Bilderbergers. The Bilderbergers are so secretive that they don't even really have a name. They're called the Bilderbergers because they were first discovered by the public meeting at, uh, in um, um, Holland back in 1954. And they were founded by Prince Barnhard of the Netherlands who had uh, previously been a Nazi SS officer. And by the way, any of you all have Texaco gas cards? you do realize that Texaco is now bought by Shell. And Shell is the, that's the royal family of Holland, the founders of the Bilderbergers. So the New World Order marches on. And of course, then we've got Skull and Bones. I think we all know that uh, Prescott Bush, the patriarch of the Bush family, and that uh, George Herbert Walker Bush and George W. Bush are all members of the Skull and Bones. Now, there are some who argue that the Skull and Bones is the secret society behind the secret societies and that they run everything. I'm not convinced of that. There are plenty of people who have been inducted into the Skull and Bones and who have elected not to follow through on all their contacts and have gone on to live very respectable and 
and good lives, okay? The skull and bones, however, is a springboard. That's where they take young men, they find the ones that with ability and more importantly those that are compliant and they groom them to become world leaders. And all you have to do is just go study about the skull and bones and you'll find that there is an inordinate number of people who go on to take top government positions. Again, if this was really a free country, you'd think that we'd have some people from, you know, Southern Cal, University of Texas, Oklahoma, somebody, you know, there's got to be some smart people around somewhere. But these folks are always the ones that end up in power. Also, it has been established that the Skull and Bones is actually the Order 322. It is the 322nd chapter of the Illuminati. This was published in the New York Times. Now we get to the question of how come you don't know all this, and that gets back to the control over the media. First, you have to understand, the media cannot control every, I mean, these people, these secret societies cannot control all the editors and all the reporters across the country. No, they control the media through the distribution of the information. Just in the past several months, there have been some massive anti-war demonstrations taking place in California, in Denver, in Washington. And most of you have heard little or nothing about them. And when you did hear about them, oh, 30,000 people, uh-uh, try 500,000. There have been massive demonstrations in England and in Germany, and you very rarely hear about that. This is because they control not the editors and publishers, but the distribution of the information. And how do they do that? I've listed two here, Time Warner and Disney. There's another couple that I could mention. Uh, Viacom is another one. Viventi is another one. Clear Channel is now buying up all of the radio stations in this country. Clear Channel bought up Premier Radio not long back, and now two of its leading voices, Whitley Strieber and Art Bell, are no longer with us. Okay? And who owns Clear Channel? Well, it's connected to the Carlisle Group. That's Henry Kissinger and the Bush family. Okay? So they are clamping down on the access to information. And never lose sight of the fact is I don't care how brilliant you are, if you make decisions based on faulty, erroneous, or incomplete information, you're not going to be making the right decision. At the top is a note that was written to James Tucker, who uh, used to write for the old Spotlight, now writes for the American Free Press, and he has tracked the Bilderbergers for years. And uh, this lady that was an ombudsman with the Washington Post sends him a note and says, well, if observations of the Bilderberg, the Trilateral Commission, Council on Foreign Relations, Aspen Institute, etc., hold true, there's much that is ponderous, but little that is newsworthy. How's that for a condescending, unthinking response? Let me put it this way. What do you think the news media's reaction would be if all of the owners of the National Football League franchises were to meet in a big hotel secretly with armed guards all around it, won't let the media in, won't let anybody in, they meet there for about a week, and then they all come out and say, sorry, I can't tell you what we talked about. Whew. Would they blow their lid or what? They'd be yelling price fixing, collusion, restraint of trade, you know, blah, blah, blah. they'd raise hell. But you get the leaders of commerce and banking and industry, and they meet once a year, and they hide themselves off in some big, well-guarded resort, and they come out and say, we're not going to tell you what we talked about. It makes a mockery of freedom of the press. It makes a mockery of freedom, period. We have got to start understanding who's really calling the shots, because until we understand what's really going on, how can we make any decisions or do anything about what's happening in our own country? I had to throw in this cartoon it says well the CBS Viacom deal look at what you get movies MTV radio videos Nickelodeon news media theme parks billboards showtime just about every kind of entertainment and advertising you could want the guy says well what about the news and he goes, this is the news <laughs> this is the news think about it folks not long back, I'm sitting at home, and I don't watch TV that much, but I happen to have it on. They said that we're going to interrupt for a news, news break. 
I'm going, okay, good, I'll catch the headline news, kind of get caught up. There were four stories that they put out over this two-minute news break or whatever it is, and all four of them were sports stories. So-and-so won the Masters, you know, so-and-so won some football game, some baseball game. Don't get me wrong, I love sports, but sports are sports. They are not news. You can get all excited about the big game, but then next week it's over with and who cares? And what does it really matter? It doesn't. And that's what's masquerading, though, as news. Now, these folks, it's already been said right here at this conference that these folks are really the big, brightest and the best, and they are more intelligent than we are. And it's only right and proper that they run everything because they only have our best interest at heart. Well, let's look back over just the past hundred years. They've given us two world wars, two depressions, one acknowledged and the one currently not. <laughs> and it doesn't sound like they're operating in our best interest. Not at all. They give us the Persian Gulf War. That was Daddy Bush's war. Drew his line in the sand. Just happened to be north of the, the Harkin Energy Holdings of he, of his son George W who just by sheer coincidence I'm sure sold off the bulk of those holdings right before the invasion of Kuwait and made himself a, almost a cool million dollars by selling short on that think you think daddy might have whispered in his ear oh no I wouldn't do that would they of course they would and then the whole thing ends just as everything's closing in got too much to cover here I could give you the whole story when the American ambassador goes to Saddam Hussein, April Glassby, and she testified to this in front of Congress but didn't go anywhere, he says, uh, we're going to go back to our original boundaries, which means he's going to take back Kuwait, which was illegally taken and carved out of uh, Iraq in the first place by the British years ago, so they could uh, get their hands on some of those southern Iraqi oil reserves. And uh, he asked the American ambassador, you know, what do, what do you all think about that? And her almost exact answer was, well, uh, I've been instructed to inform you that we consider that an Arab problem and we don't really have any thoughts on that. What does that sound like? Sounds like do what you want to do. And then the minute he sends his troops into Kuwait, oh, he's the new Hitler. All right. And the Saudis put up a $12 billion war chest hidden in a secret account in, in London for George Bush to use to prosecute the Persian Gulf War. It's a deal, folks. It's just a deal. They're all just deals. This whole thing right now, I'll tell you what I suspect. We all know this thing from about Iraq is about oil. But why do we need the oil? We got plenty of oil in the United States, and we're not getting that much out of the Middle East anyway. And besides that, we now have our troops in Afghanistan, which means we now control the Caspian Sea oil reserves. Something that's been a big bone of contention for the last hundred years, ever since the Nobel brothers went over there and started. Uh, uh, production in the Caspian Sea area. When Hitler sent his sixth army charging through the Ukraine, they weren't going to capture Stalingrad. They were trying to get to those Caspian Sea oil reserves, but they got stopped at Stalingrad. It's been a big bone of contention. Everybody wants to get a hold of Caspian Sea oil. Well, now we have it. And Britain now wants their share. They want the Iraqi oil. And it's really funny because we see Tony Blair uh, standing up and he's pushing for war with Iraq just about as hard as uh, George Bush. And we think, oh, our wonderful British allies, boy, they're with us through thick and thin. I think once you study these secret societies and where they came from and who's really behind all this, it's the other way around. BP wants the oil but they can't move British troops into Iraq because quite correctly that would be perceived as aggression. But the United States has already fought a war with Iraq, so we can go in and take it for them. Y'all just hide and watch. If we have a war and we have a regime change and we get gain control over Iraq, you hide and watch if British Petroleum doesn't get a big chunk of that. It's all about oil, we all know that. And the problem is we're all so fat and sassy. We well, yeah, but I gotta have gas for my car, man. I gotta drive down to the 7-Eleven and get a pack of cigarettes, you know. I mean, yeah, it's only a block away, but who wants to walk a block? You know? We are just really so we just have no idea of uh the misery in most of the world because we all have it so well. I mean, you know.
So it's all about oil, and my big complaint there is, is we don't need the damn oil, okay? We don't need to be on a petroleum energy basis anyway. There's so much other things we could be doing. Uh, do you realize that with just some tweaking of the intake uh, jets in your carburetor, you could be running your car on hydrogen? And hydrogen does not cause any pollution. And hydrogen is the most plentiful substance on the planet. Think about it. This is a water planet. H2O, two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. We could be burning hydrogen. We don't even need the damn oil. But no, we're going to go over there and kill a whole bunch of people and probably our own troops. And look what's happening with the Gulf veterans right now. They're all coming down with all kinds of sicknesses, probably because of the contaminated vaccines they got. Also, the depleted uranium shells that were lying everywhere, giving them a radiation dose that destroys their immunization system, not to mention the, the oily smoke and petrochemicals hanging in the air. And do you think that a new war with Iraq is going to be any better? Never mind the massive casualties that Iraq's going to suffer. Wait till our guys come back and we have another 20 years and they'll be raising hell about their, their health problems. And uh, what's the government going to do about it? I'll tell you right now, not a damn thing. Let me tell you something, when I was in the Army, this just really gets my blood to boiling when I think about this. When I was in the Army back during Vietnam, we'd get sea rations and in the sea rations along with the powdered milk and the, this and the other thing was a little packet of cigarettes. You have five little cigarettes. We always thought that was cool, free cigarettes. And those who didn't smoke would swap them around to those who did, and they, it was almost a medium of exchange. And that practice goes way on back even through World War II. Where do you think all those guys in World War II got the smoking habits? Because the Army gave them free cigarettes. And now under the Clinton administration, when some of these guys who put their life on the line to fight for freedom and democracy in World War II, and they start coming down with emphysema and lung cancer, and they go to the VA under the Clinton administration, they ruled that that was a self-inflicted disease and that they would not treat the veterans. That's shameful, folks. That's shameful. You give your soldiers cigarettes all through their career and then you won't treat them when they get a health-related problem? Unconscionable. But that's what happens when you let these secret society creeps run your country. Going back past the Gulf War, and now we get back to Vietnam, and uh, Lyndon Johnson and his wise men, okay? He surrounded himself with about 12, 14 guys, and they were every one of them counsel on foreign relations. In fact, Vietnam, the thing I never could quite figure out is why were we fighting 9,000 miles away from the shores of the United States? Well, let me tell you why. Because right after World War II, the Council on Foreign Relations published some papers that were saying we needed to gain control over the mineral resources of Southeast Asia, which at that time was called French Indochina. All right, but then in the spring of 1954, the French got defeated at the Battle of Dinh Bien Phu, and they withdrew from French Indochina. Within weeks, John Foster Dulles, a founder of the Council on Foreign Relations, and who was then Secretary of State Dwight Eisenhower goes to the Philippines and creates something called the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization, CETO. And he later explained that he did that to give the American president the legal precedent for intervention in South, in Southeast Asia. That was the beginning of the whole thing. Now, is he acting on the best interest of the United States, or is he acting on the best interest of the Council on Foreign Relations that wanted control over those mineral resources? And, of course, I don't have to tell you what happened. 58,000 American lives later, we finally slunk away with our tail between our legs, defeated by a bunch of guys in, in rubber sandals, thanks to the wise men. And in the middle of this, when our guys are dying in the jungles of Vietnam, Who's over in Russia but David Rockefeller meeting with Khrushchev? And, on the exist and uh, with the insistence of David Rockefeller and his other powerful friends at the Council on Foreign Relations, they encouraged Lyndon Johnson to increase loans to Russia at levels higher than we did in World War II when they were our allies against Hitler. Now, what does this mean? It means, folks, that while our sons and daughters and brothers and husbands were over there fighting for their lives in the jungles of Vietnam, we were told we had to do that because North 
Vietnam was a surrogate of China and Russia, and that if we didn't stop them there, then it's the domino effect, and they'd take over the Philippines, and they'd take over Hawaii, and they'd take over this country, and we had to stop them right there. And that they were getting arms and ammunition from China and Russia, and it was an anti-communist crusade. And to that extent, it was true. They were getting arms and ammunition and war materials from China and Russia. And Russia was getting loans from us. And they'd take our tax-supported money, and they'd build facilities like the Kama River Truck Factory, and they'd crank out war materials to ship to North Vietnam to use against our guys. Does that make any sense to anybody? But that's what goes on, folks, and it's still going on. And unless we start waking up, it's going to continue. If you stop and think about it, gunfire has pretty well decided every national election from 1964 to 1988. 64, Lyndon Johnson wins on the sympathy because of the JFK assassination. 68, Nixon wins after uh, uh, the... Uh, reaction to the Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy shootings. Then in 1972, uh, George Wallace looks like he's going to pull votes from Nixon and he's shot. 1976, Carter uh, uh, wins after there were assassination attempts on Gerald Ford. And then in 1980, Reagan is elected after an assassination attempt on Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter? You don't remember the assassination attempt on Jimmy Carter? Why, he had asked for national TV time in the late spring of 1979, and he was going to announce some sweeping changes in government, including curtailing the CIA. But then he goes to Los Angeles, and he's attacked by Raymond Lee Harvey and Oswaldo Ortiz. So Lee Harvey and Oswaldo were going to kill him in Los Angeles. There it is. You saw it in the Newsweek article, but you don't remember that, do you? Because it didn't get distributed in the news media. And right after that, he canceled his national TV talk, went to seclusion at Camp David, called in everybody up to and including Billy Graham, and said, I've lost control of the government. And he was out, and Reagan was in. And two months after Reagan was elected, he shot. And if that bullet had been that much closer, it had hit his heart, and we would have had George Bush eight years earlier. People don't think about that, do they? Oh, well, I just guess that's a conspiracy theory. Speaking of, you're going to love this one, the Reagan shooting. All network tapes, clearly, you can clearly hear the sound of seven shots. Bam, 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 bam. Hinkley had a six-shot revolver. How do you get seven shots out of a six-shot revolver? And where did it come from? Up there, circling red, the bullet that struck Reagan was at a downward trajectory. Go back and check the media. They, they accurately reported that. And Hinckley, though, is standing level with him over here in the crowd, back over here beyond that policeman. Up here is a sliding glass door with a human figure crouched behind that door. Was this the person who actually shot Reagan? We don't know because there's never any investigations because all that's just conspiracy theory. But of course, Reagan was shot, and for months, the person who was really in charge was George Herbert Walker Bush. You're going back to Korea. You find out that Russian generals were running the Korean War on both sides. Does that make any sense? And yet the bulk of the Allied troops was our guys. United States military supported by our tax dollars. We're really being taken, folks. Go all the way back to World War II. Again, I, I noticed it was mentioned here at this conference that, well, uh, everything would have been okay except Hitler was the bad guy, and, and he, he kind of screwed everything up. Well, let me tell you, folks, do your homework. Hitler didn't just suddenly appear. Hitler, number one, was a military intelligence agent who was assigned to infiltrate the Nazi party. And he went back to his superiors and said, well, there's a, went to this meeting, there's only about nine guys there, but you'd like them because they want to rebuild Germany and they hate the Jews and they want to they rearm and they want to repudiate the Versailles Treaty. So his superior said, ah, oh, that sounds pretty good. Here's some money, go back and help out. 
So they created Hitler. And then as he began to gain more power, who was behind him? Another secret society, the Thule Gesellschaft, or the Thule Society, made up of some of the leading industrialists, leading intellectuals in Germany at the time. People, and also people who had an intimate working knowledge of the occult. All right? So now we can see that all of these secret societies have been working along. And it was the same thing back during World War One. Same people ran World War One. It's amazing, but uh, but uh, at the time of the Russian Revolution, where was Lenin? He wasn't in Russia. He was in Switzerland. Where was uh, Leon Trotsky, the the communist philo key philosopher? He wasn't in Russia. He was in New York City working for Wall Street capitalists. And they gave him money, and they gave him uh, all kinds of support to go into Russia and take over a popular uprising and change it into a communist government. Lenin was the same thing. We all know that he was put on a sealed railroad car and traveled through wartime Germany that was at war with Russia and was sent on into Russia to take over the government and set up the communist system. And one of the people who helped facilitate that was a leading banker in Germany who also was very highly connected with German intelligence, and that was a fellow by the name of Max Warburg. Now, don't you find it passing strange that in World War I, Max Warburg, who was head of German intelligence and a big leading banker there in Germany, his brother, Paul Warburg, founded the Federal Reserve System in our country and at that time was head of the, of the financial end of World War I for the United States of America. Does nobody find that amazing? Here he is, Paul Warburg. And, and here's the house on Jekyll Island where the plans were laid to instill upon us the Federal Reserve System which is neither federal nor has any reserves, all right? It is a system of 12 banks. <laughs> it's a system of 12 banks that are in turn owned by other private banks. And in fact, most of the studies that have been done show that the majority of ownership in the banks that control the Federal Reserve are held by people who are not even Americans. Think about that one. I could get into money and the whole thing, but let's keep going. Here's the original Federal Reserve Board, and there's, my, there's old Paul. He headed up the original Federal Reserve Board. And here we see Woodrow Wilson and Colonel House and his wife. And this is where it begins to tie into the older secret societies, because as I've pointed out, Trilateral Commission connects to the CFR, the Intercorps leadership is Bilderberger. The CFR was created right after World War I by Colonel House, Bernard Baruch, and others to try to sell us on the idea of globalization. And these folks had been members of the old uh, Cecil Rhodes uh, secret society called the Round Tables. Here is a cartoon from 1911 showing Karl Marx shaking hands with uh, J.P. Morgan, George Perkins, Teddy Roosevelt, John Ryan of National City Bank, John D. Rockefeller, and Andrew Carnegie. They financed communism. They created it. Why? So they could play both ends against the middle. Think of Cold War. And now it's over with. And think of the billions of dollars that were squandered on that Cold War. Think of what this country could be today if we'd spent that money building schools and upgrading education, upgrading health facilities. No, 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 that was not gonna make them money. So see, back in 1911, those old folks knew better about what was really going on than we do today. And this is just a little graphic showing the New World Order and how that it tracks on down. You can take a look at that. I do want to mention the Hegelian dialectic. That sounds pretty fancy, but basically all it is is just um, action response and then synthesis, whatever you work out. You all do this all the time. You and your wife or husband decide you want to go to the movies. 
One of you says you want to go see movie A. The other one says, no, I don't want to see that. I want to see movie B. Okay? Well, the one who wants to see movie A, that's thesis. That's his thesis or her thesis. One says, I want to see movie B. That's antithesis or antithesis, the antithesis. Okay? Now, then you work it out. If you're like me and my wife, what we usually do is end up going seeing movie C, <laughs> which is second choice for both of us, but it's one we can agree on. That is synthesis. And that's how it works. And, and all Hegel did was simply kind of work out this formula for human interaction. But where the secret society folks took a leg up on it is, is they figured out you don't have to wait for a problem and then offer it a solution and then how it works out is what you get. You create a problem. You create a problem. Then you offer the solution and then whatever's worked out, you got it. When the Murrah Federal Building was bombed, they had anti-terrorist legislation pending in Congress. And some of it was pretty draconian. They, it was going to just shred the Constitution. And most people were going, wait a minute, I don't know, I don't know. They weren't going for it. And it was hung up. It wasn't going anywhere. Boom, Federal Building in Oklahoma blows up. I'm not going to go into that, but most of you know there's a whole lot more there than Timothy McVeigh and his little fertilizer bomb, okay? But boom, it goes up. All right, now you got a problem. And what's the solution? Got to pass all this anti-terrorism legislation. So then, but then that's a problem. So what's the solution? Well, you, you work on it, you water it down, and it, it still got passed. Not to the extent they originally wanted, but it got passed. And it's the same thing that we knew the communists did for years. Two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. This stuff they've rammed through over the past year, Homeland Security, Patriot Act, you hide and watch as the years drove on, unless, unless they pump us up again with some other terrorist act, which they're liable to if we start balking at everything, but courts will begin to throw some of that stuff out and the thing will start coming back into balance. Already there are 60 cities in the United States that have passed ordinances that uh, are ordering their local police and, and law enforcement people not, not to enforce Homeland Security and Patriot Act provisions because they're unconstitutional. Of course, you don't hear much about that through the mass control corporate media, but it's happening. And there will be a backlash. It will come, and things will balance out a little bit. But see, it's already on the books. And, one, and this Homeland Security thing, once you create that whole level of bureaucracy, I guarantee it'll never go away. The CIA is a good example. That was intended to be exactly what it says, the Central Intelligence Agency. It was going to be a small agency that was going to take the intelligence from the Army and the Air Force and the Navy and everybody else and, and coordinate it. And it was, it was intended to stop uh, duplication of effort. And instead it created a whole monster that we're still having to deal with. Okay? And it'll never go away. Homeland Security will never go away. We should never have passed it in the first place, but there was no debate, no talk. They got Homeland Security the night they got, they, it started off, it was a 30-page thesis saying here's what we probably need to do. And by the time it got to Congress, it was 500 pages, and they got it the night before the vote. Now, folks, I don't care how smart you are, you can't read 500 pages, absorb it, and think about it, and make an intelligent decision. And I'll tell you, for that one fact alone, and I'm not even going to argue the merits of Homeland Security, but for the mere fact that your representatives passed a law that they hadn't even read, I think should be cause enough for a recall. You ought to throw every one of them out. Because what's the first thing a lawyer will tell you? Never sign anything until you've read it. And these guys passed the Patriot Act and the Homeland Security, and they didn't even read it. They had no idea what they were passing. Does any of you all remember back about 1997 or 1998, there was a little furor that got going over something called a, a, a banking program called Know Your Customer. Anybody remember that? 
Yeah, yeah. And the whole idea was is that your bank was going to have to turn around and be a snitch to the federal government. If you were to, if your deposits somehow were a little bit different than the, the normal or if you withdrew an inordinate amount of money or whatever, they were going to report you, be required to report you. And they were going to keep massive personal information files, okay? Your wife, your family, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, but that kind of got public and everybody went, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're not going to put up with that. And sure enough, they kind of backed off and we all thought, we all felt real good, right, that they didn't get that through. It's in Homeland Security. It's in there. It's happening. And you never got to vote on it, did you? You can go all the way back to the war between the states or where I come from, we call it the War of Northern Aggression. <laughs> but it was a deal. It was all a deal. August Belmont, a registered agent of the Rothschild banking family in Europe, came to this country and quickly became the leading seller of bonds for the federal government. He's the one that got the money to prosecute the war between the states. At the same time, he was quietly buying up all the southern bonds. It was a deal. Even Chancellor Bismarck of Germany is on the record as saying that the war in the, in the uh, 1860s in the United States was contrived by the Rothschilds to split the country in half so that they could regain North America for the bankers in France and Britain. And if you'll stop and think about it, where was the bulk of the British Army? It was in Canada. Where was the French Army? Anybody? Mexico, under Maximilian. So they were going to let the north and south bleed each other dry, and then they were going to move in. There's only one man who seemed to understand what was going on, and that was the head Yankee, Abraham Lincoln. I'll have to give him some grudging credit. I think he understood what was happening. And that's why he became the first American president to print his own money, known as greenbacks. Do you know there's only been one other president? in the history of this country that tried to print interest-free money? John F. Kennedy. June 1963, he ordered the issuance of six billion dollars in currency, not through the Federal Reserve System, but through the United States Treasury. I have a five dollar note. It says series 1963. It's got red ink on it. It says United States note. It doesn't say Federal Reserve note. And I don't think it's a coincidence that both of those presidents were shot in the head. So now we can see what I call my pyramid of power. That's us down at the bottom. <laughs> the poor, long-suffering public. Over us is the low-level political structure. There's your local city council, school board, and stuff. Most of whom are good people trying to do a difficult job. A few snakes in there, but you know, as we learned in the Army, there's always 2% that won't go along with the program and your mass media. And this thing maybe that disturbs me most about the mass media having worked in it, it's not that they're bad, it's not that they're liberal, it's not that they're conservative, it's that they're dumb and they're lazy, okay? They don't want to work, so they will not go out and really pursue a story or look past the superficial explanation. They just take the government handout and they run with it. And this really bothers me because, you know, I think, think about it in our own personal life. Um, if, if you have a good friend and you find that friend is lying to you, then that upsets you. And, but that's a friend, so you try to forgive them and you try to rationalize and think, well, maybe they just didn't understand. Then you, get, then you catch them lying to you again. Well, now it's going, boy, I don't know. Third or fourth time they lie to you, they're no longer your friend, are they? You, I, I, you just say, I don't want to have anything to do with that person. He's a liar. Well, the government has got caught lie after lie after lie after lie, and still they come out and say something, and the news media just runs with it as if that's the gospel. And then it takes six months, six years, 40 years for us to find out that it was all a big lie. Then you come on up to your military intelligence agencies and your high-level political structure. Then you come on up to the multinational corporations and the, the, the hub of the New World Order, the United Nations, and it's now military arm, NATO. Okay, and then you come on up through the 
uh, Council on Foreign Relations, and you notice they're not even at the top of the pyramid, because you get up higher and it even gets higher, and then you get up to the, John Coleman calls the Committee of 300, others call the Illuminati, and then you got a big question mark, because who's telling those people what to do? Now we start into real history. I'm not going to really belabor you about Freemasonry other than to tell you that you might want to be aware that the first third party in the United States was the anti-Masonic party. And they broke the back of Masonic Freemason or Freemasonry back in the early 1800s and it never quite recovered until after the Civil War. Within Freemasonry, the, uh, this isn't my theory, this is what Masonic historians and writers will tell you, if they're honest. There's a huge outer circle. Well, first let me say this, there's a tremendous difference between European Freemasonry and American Freemasonry. The, Nor the European Freemasonry is much more sinister and has much more ties to, uh, to politics and to the Illuminati. But the Ameri North American Freemasonry is much more of a kind of a fraternal order, and they do great things. Their burn centers are wonderful. But within Freemasonry, on, in both sides of the ocean, there's an outer circle, and then there's a little inner core circle that knows what's really going on and what their agenda really is. Now, don't bother to ask a Masonic friend if that's true, because he will tell you no. And that's because he's either part of the outer circle, in which case he really truly does not know that there's an inner circle, or he's part of the inner circle, in which case he's taken a blood oath never to reveal that. Okay? But Freemasonry is where a lot of these thoughts, ideals, and knowledge has been passed along because the men who made up Cecil Rhodes' roundtables, which were the progenitors of the Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral, etc., were Illuminized Freemasons. They were Freemasons who had been instilled with the knowledge and with the agendas of the Illuminati. And what was that? Where did they think they got all this from? Well, here's Manly Wade Hall, uh, a philosopher, a much studied occultist, and, and a very high-ranking mason. And he says, in the Roanoke Pass, the gods walked with men, and they chose from among the sons of God the wisest and the truest. And these they labored with, preparing them to carry on the work of the gods after the spiritual hierarchies themselves had withdrawn into the invisible worlds. With these specially ordained and illumined sons, they left the keys of their great wisdom. These illumined ones founded what we now know as the ancient mysteries. George Washington, big Masonic. So they're passing along the ancient mysteries through Freemasonry. By the way, if you think that the Illuminati is just something you can laugh at and just some kind of boogaboo, here's a letter in 1782 from George Washington where he said, it was not my intention to doubt that the doctrines of the Illuminati had not spread to the United States. On the contrary, no one is more fully satisfied of that fact than I am. These guys knew more about what was going on than we do today with all our modern technology and all our electronic communications. Uh, we could, I could spend a whole program talking about Washington, D.C. and the layout of the streets and how it was all built by Masons and that how the, uh, f the uh, floor plan, ground street plan of Washington parallels Virgo, which has always been associated with the Egyptian goddess Isis. Okay. So these people, and by the way, if, you, if you're not aware of this, some of you are, some of you aren't. Every time there's a space launch, okay, there is, it's always at a certain time and in a certain manner to conform with astrological numbers, okay? Somebody somewhere still has a great concern about the stars and what's happening. All right, there in, in Washington, D.C., there are 23 major zodiacs in that city, more than any other city in the world. One other thing you're going to love, I don't think it's not on this map. In the earliest plat of Washington, D.C., all the lots are numbered except one. You get up to uh, 665, and then it jumps to 667, 668. So what's missing? 666, 666, and guess what sits on that lot today? The capital of the United States. 
Now, it's accepted by historians that the French Revolution was fomented by the Illuminati. And here's a picture of Adam Weishaupt, who founded the Bavarian Illuminati, and he was only carrying on traditions and knowledge that came from either even much older uh, uh, things. And I think it would be worth quickly look at the ten steps offered by Karl Marx in his Communist Manifesto, and if you'll compare this to Illuminati writings, you'll find that their goals have always been the same. And, and as I read these, I want you to think about where we are in this country today in relation to this topic. Abolition of private property. Not there yet, but they're working on it. Now we've got wet zones and United Nations zones and whatever. A progressive or graduated income tax. Well, we got that. Abolition of all inheritance. They're working on that. Confiscation of property of dissidents and immigrants. Homeland Security's got that taken care of. Creation of a monopolistic central bank. Well, that was done back in 1913. Centralize all communication and transport. Well, see, when Karl Marx offered this, he was thinking in terms of state control. Today, it's corporate control. And instead of the state running the corporations, today, I think, in this country, it's the other way around. Control of all factories and farm production. Again, corporate control. Central ownership of capital with deplorable workforce. That's us. Oops, got to, got to move from Silicon Valley. No more jobs. We've got to go somewhere else. Blur the distinction between rural country and cities. Boy, that's being done. I moved to the country 22 years ago. It was a wonderful little place. Now I go down there, there's McDonald's, Sonic, Krispy Kreme donut shop. You know, might as well be in Fort Worth or Dallas. Free public education for all children, which on the surface of it sounds like a wonderful idea, and I'm all for it. I think every single kid, no matter where he comes from, no matter what color he is, no matter what, should have a shot at learning the, the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. But folks, that's it. After that, if he has aptitude, he should be able to go on. If he doesn't, he should go to trade schools. This thing, the education has turned into a huge monster. And look what's going on in education today. And look what, if you stop and check what they're being taught. And, and today, they're not even being taught. It, it, what's important is they have to feel good about themselves. That's why we, they're trying to do away with grading systems. That's why they're trying to do away with the SATs and all like that. Well, we don't want somebody feeling left behind because they, they can't pass those tests. We want them to feel good about themselves. Well, all I can say is how good about themselves they're going to feel when they're 50 years old and all they can do is sit on the street corner and sell pencils. You know, you've got to have that education. And they're not getting it. The, the dumbing down of America is not just a catchword. It is actually happening. So all of these things that were advanced by the Illuminati long before uh, even uh, Karl Marx are all agendas that are still being pushed along on us. And where did they came from? They came from the Knights Templars who built these wonderful cathedrals such as Chartres that has stained glass in it that is so luminous that modern science cannot explain how they do that. Here's some of the stained glass from, uh, the, from charts, and you can also see the, uh, the uh, similarities between the charts at the bottom and uh, the uh, Al-Qaeda mosque in Jerusalem's Temple Mount. They brought back knowledge from the Middle East. Again, look at the striking similarities between these Egyptian uh, artifacts and artifacts in, in Jerusalem. Uh, you've got a black Madonna that you still find in southern France compared to uh, Isis. Uh, over here you've got the winged uh, person from uh, Egypt and another one that was found in a 9th century BC Jewish palace. It's all the same information, folks. It's all the same. We've been taught that here's all these different empires and civilizations. It's all a continuation. Uh, this is a great one. At the top, of course, you can see the famous Egyptian winged disc that Sitchin and others says probably represents the planet Nibiru. <laughs> and then bottom is a crop circle. Probably a hoax one, but it uh, shows that somebody's still thinking in terms of the winged disc. 
Now this brings us to the mystery of Rennes Le Chateau. And for those of you that have read Holy Blood, Holy Grail, the Messianic Legacy and all like that, they go into this in great detail, but they never really, really quite just tell you what it really is, other than the fact that there apparently is some fabulous treasure buried over in the, in the caverns and cave systems at Honeycomb, the foothills of the Pyrenees there in southern France. And I was there two years ago, and it is an amazing place. It really is, and the stories are all there. Poussin, the artist, apparently was on to some of these secrets because in this painting up here circle in red he seems to be giving us a fleeting glimpse of what the ark of the covenant so there's some there's all of this knowledge that's being passed along here here is the again the the masonic and zodiacal uh, street plans of Washington compared to the same, you see the same geometric designs being used to build Rennes Le Chateau. Again, we see the same knowledge being passed down. Here's what you probably don't realize. Rennes Le Chateau is on the far left corner over here, and if you connect these holy sites, you have a geometric pentagram that encompasses a 40-mile circumference area. Any of you that have read Maurice Shaitlin's book know about the Maltese cross that is in the Aegean Sea that you can only connect by getting a map and connecting these sacred sites. Again, ancient knowledge passed along. Some of it, it lost, some of it gets distorted, but it's all coming down through the secret societies. And where did it all start? It started in southern Iraq, also known as Mesopotamia. In the Bible, it's referred to as the Chaldees or Chaldea. Now, one of the tragic things of the, of the uh, turmoil that's going on in the Middle East is the fact that what you actually have are cousins, family people fighting each other because the Arabs trace their lineage back to the biblical patriarch Abraham. And the Jews trace their heritage back to the biblical patriarch Abraham. So they're all related, but they can't get along. If we could go back to that, uh, to the map. The Bible tells us that Abraham came from Ur of the Chaldees. So he was not a Jew. He was not even a Semite. He was a Sumerian. And he had knowledge from the ancient Sumerian culture. And he brought that knowledge where? To Egypt. This is where the, the great Egyptian civilization got started with the knowledge that was brought out of Mesopotamia. Now we get to the question, and now the rest of it, more knowledge was brought by Moses. Except who was Moses? There is a very cogent argument to be made that, that Moses, is, Moses is not a name, it's a title. Moses, meaning the pretender to the throne, the one true heir. And now we go and we look at the story of Moses. Oh, he was hidden away as a baby. He was placed in a basket of bulrushes, floated down the river to uh, relatives, raised by foster parents, educated as an Egyptian, believed in the one true God. Now, you know what? If you go back and study about Akhenaten or Amenhotep IV, you find that it's the same story. <laughs> Hidden away as a baby, placing a basket of bull rushes, floated down the river, raised by foster family. The foster family were Hebrew slaves. Well, you all know, any of you all who have adopted or are adopted or are, are adopting children, your real parents are who raise you, not who gives birth to you. Okay? We all know this. So, um, and Hotep is raised by Hebrews who instill in him the idea of the one true God. And when he assumes the uh, throne as Pharaoh, he changes his name to Akhenaten, meaning the one who worships, worships Atim, the one true God. And in the, even in the Bible, it says he was an Egyptian of, you know, or had great knowledge of Egypt, was very powerful in Egypt. How does a Hebrew slave get that? So now that whole story takes on a whole different coloration. And when he leads when he is overthrown because he's shaken up the 
the, the religious hierarchy of the day, which was making tons of money because everybody had to pay homage to all the various gods. They didn't like that, so they overthrew Akhenaten and they banished him. And when he left, he took his family with him, the Israelites or the Hebrews. And he was, they considered him still the one true king or Moses. But whether or not that's true, we find again that all of the information flows from um, Iraq or Samaria into Egypt. And of course we know that from Egypt then all this knowledge was centered in the ancient mystery schools of Egypt, which then went on to the ancient mystery schools of Greece and then on into the Romans, and this was our Western heritage. Now, all of this was accumulated regardless of who Moses was, whether he was a, a title or a name, when the Israelites were sent out of Egypt and freed, they were told to take what you need. Well, some of them, I'm sure that meant take some clothing, take some food, but some of them meant take everything that wasn't nailed down. And they took gold, silver, they took scrolls, they took all kinds of things on their travels in the wilderness. And we know that during their travels in the wilderness, they attacked and conquered a variety of people and city-states. And as was the habit in that time, oops, are we out of time? Oh, thank God, I saw something here. Okay, good, we're on track. I gotta wrap this up though, because I know you're gonna have some questions. So I'll make it quick. So they got this vast treasure hoard, gold, silver, but they've also got knowledge passed down from uh, Samaria. And I'm sure they got tired of lugging all this through the desert. So at one point, Solomon built a huge temple. And part of it, of course, was to worship. Part of it was to house the Ark of the Covenant, their communication device for God, and to house and warehouse all of this fabulous treasure. So what happened to it? Interestingly enough, when the Romans took Palestine, they didn't just move in and conquer it. They, uh, they worked a deal. They said, look, if you'll let us, uh, you can keep your king and you can keep your lifestyle if you'll just pay homage to Rome. And they said, okay, and King Herod was installed, built his palace over the old, at the same place as the old Solomon Temple there on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, which is now, of course, a Muslim mosque, the Dome of the Rock. Um, but then the Jews began to chafe under the Roman leadership and uh, in 66 AD there was a revolt. I'm sure it didn't just start overnight and it didn't end overnight. The Romans then sent troops in and they conquered the whole thing. Well, when they came in they sacked Jerusalem and they sacked the temple. Uh, King Herod's palace at that time, formerly the, the Temple of Solomon. But they didn't get everything because the Jews knew what were happening and they took everything they could and they buried it under the temple in a series of cave systems and stuff and they carefully hid it away from the Romans. But the Romans nevertheless got a good portion of it, maybe even half or something, but they got a good portion. And what did they do with it? Well, they took it as booty back to Rome. 400 years later, Alaric the Goth sacks Rome. And again, as the way it happens, they took everything out of there. They took what the treasure, some, half the treasure of Solomon, and they took it back to their home stomping grounds, which was where? The Landioc region of southern France. And they hid it in the cave systems down there. And this was both the wealth, treasure, and particularly the information and knowledge that was passed along to a group of people that became known as the Cathars. And the Cathars then were a thorn in the side of the Roman church because they had straight information. They had information that went contrary to what the Roman church was trying to put out, and that's why they never went along with their program. This, of course, gave rise to the Albigensian Crusade, where the Pope sent a papal army through the Landioc region and murdered everybody that was suspected of being a Cathar. That's where the expression got started, by the way, when they besieged the town of Brazier's. Uh, they sent a message back to the Pope and said, how are we going to know the Cathars from everybody else? And the Pope is supposedly told him, he said, well, kill them all and let God sort them out. 
And we've heard that same quote. I heard that during Vietnam. You know, how do we tell the VC from the Vietnamese? Kill them all, let God sort them out. So this, uh, but they didn't, obviously they didn't kill all the Cathars. Some of the wealthy families there in southern France were Cathars. And they knew, because they had access to this knowledge, that the rest of the treasure of Solomon is buried over beneath Herod's palace in Jerusalem. So they fomented the Crusades, ostensibly to retake the Holy Land. But in reality, these French families, the uh, Blanchards and, uh, uh, and uh, St. Bernard and these folks, they knew this treasure was over there and they wanted it. And so sure enough, in 1099, they conquered Jerusalem. And who shows up but nine knights from southern France, all connected to these Cathari families. And they say, we want to form a new military order called the Knights of the Temple. And so King Baldwin says, OK. And so he, he uh, allows them to form the Knights Templar. And they were supposed to be guarding the roads there, but they never did. What they did was excavate under the uh, temple and regained the rest of the treasure of Solomon. Again, not only a treasure of gold, silver, and precious stones, but a treasure of knowledge. And they hauled it from Jerusalem back through Rome and back into the Landioc region. And now at this point, the treasure of Solomon is reunited and hidden away in southern France in the area of rennes la chateau That's what the mystery is all about. That's the treasure. Now whether Father Saunier ever actually found the treasure is open to question. I suspect not. But he knew that that's what it was all about. He knew that this was in the right area. And that's why he was suddenly wealthy and all this strange things went on with rennes la chateau And the, this was just a picture of the knights. Uh, that they showing their Maltese cross. And of course, then the Pope goes after the Knights Templars because he knows that they have dangerous information plus wealth. What happened to the reunited wealth near Rensselaer Chateau? In March of 1944, Otto Scorzini, the guy in the cap with the binoculars, leads a battalion of SS troops to southern France. Working off of the notes and, and publications of a German named Otto Rahn, who had been to rennes la chateau several times in the 20s and 30s, and had working closely with Heinrich Himmler and his SS group that was heavy and involved in the occult, they felt like they knew where the treasure was. And on March the 16th, 1944, uh, they send uh, the Germans into the, they couldn't do it before then because southern France was part of Vichy France uh, and, uh, and technically was supposed to be free France and they didn't want to cause any more trouble. But in September of 43, uh, Rome fell and Mussolini was deposed and at the same time that the Germans rescued Mussolini off the mountaintop, they also uh, poured into southern France and took over the whole country. So now they're able to freely operate in France, and they sent troops down there in March of 44. He sends a one-word one word telegram back to Berlin on March the 16th that says, Eureka, I found it. The greatest, most fabulous treasure in the history of the world, both of riches and of knowledge, is now in the hands of the Nazis. They took it back to Berchtesgaden, which you can see the diagram here has an underground labyrinth of hidden systems and caves and bunkers and everything else. But it probably did not remain there. It was taken out of Germany on something called Auction Flute or Operation Eagle Flight. This was instigated in August of 1944 by the head of the German Central Bank and the head of the IG Farben Combine and Martin Bormann, who by that time was running the show. Hitler was pretty much over the edge with megalomania plus all the drugs that he was being fed. These guys took the combined wealth of Europe that they had looted plus Solomon's treasure and they created 750 corporations all around the world. They're connecting banks were the Bank of International Settlements, the Deutsche Bank, which today is still a powerhouse in the financial world, 
Chase Bank, which later became Chase Manhattan, and I particularly want you to notice Union Banking Corporation. Because in 1942, one of the chief stockholders of the Union Banking Corporation was prosecuted in this country by the Justice Department under the Trading with the Enemies Act, and they accused him of being nothing but a financial front man for Hitler and the Nazis. And that man was Prescott Bush, and also his father-in-law, George Herbert Walker. So when you hear people say that these people running the country today are a bunch of neo-Nazis, I want you to stand up and say, that is not so. There's nothing neo about them. They're the real old Nazis. <laughs> And the attorneys for the Schroeder Bank, which was one of the chief connecting banking operations, was a law firm in New York, uh, Sullivan and Cromwell, and their leading attorneys who worked with the Nazis was John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles. John Foster Dulles, Secretary of State under Eisenhower, the guy that brought us the Vietnam War, and Alan Dulles, of course, who was one of the longest running CIA directors, who then sat on the Warren Commission to determine what happened to John Kennedy. All roads lead back to Sumar. You hear about the Babylonian civilization, the Akkadian civilization, uh, et cetera, et cetera. These were nothing more than just de-evolution of the original Sumerian civilization, and I'm not going to bore you with that, although if we could get the graphic back up, uh, you, you might want to notice that in this ancient steel up here, circle in red, this, this dates back about three or 4,000 years before the Bible was ever written down, and it correctly shows the size and placement of the planets in the solar system. How'd they know that? Well, of course, we know how they know that. I'm not going to get into this. This is Sitchin's material. Others are now finding this out. 425,000 years ago, the Anunnaki came to Earth. And we know this because it was written down in ancient tablets that are still in existence. But where are they? Most of them are in Iraq the one place you can't go. And I'm, we'll skim through this. You know, most of you know the story of the Anunnaki, okay, and how that there was wars broke out between them. We also know that they claim that they took a primitive earth female, shall we call her Lucy, and uh, they manipulated her DNA, did some genetic engineering, and came up with a worker race, which I think goes far to explain the absence of the missing link. There is no missing link. He had Neanderthal, and then his DNA genetic makeup was tweaked, and then you had Cro-Magnon, modern man. Uh, we could go into the similarities of the names and the writings, but let's rush on through. It's also interesting that the ancient Sumerian tablets also give the exact same account of the biblical flood with the only notable exception. There's two, two notable exceptions. One is that, of course, in the Bible, his name is Noah, and in the ancient Sumerian tablets, his name is uh, Utnap Pishkin or something like that. The one thing I find that's a little bit different, too, but really brought a light bulb over my head I had always had trouble with this idea of two of every animals on board this ship. <laughs> but I did figure out where they went to the bathroom. <laughs> on the poop deck. <laughs> no, that's, that's terrible. But I never really could figure out. All you know, they got lions and tigers and sh sheep and goats and they're all there side by side. I, how could that work? Well, in the ancient Sumerian tablets, it doesn't say they took two of every animal. It says they took the seed of every living thing. Oops, hello. Now I see instead of a boatload of animals, you've got one little closet on board this ark that has DNA tissue in it. And they can reconstruct all of the, and you know that's going on right now? Do you know that they are right now, they are storing away DNA tissue on plants, animals, everything on this planet. So if, if there is some sort of huge cataclysm that they hopefully can rebuild everything. Now what's also interesting to me is that a lot of, how many of y'all are like Celtic music and, and uh, all this good stuff? Yeah, it's kind of a fad right now. Are you aware that the Celts and the Druids did not originate in the British Isles? 
they migrated from Iraq, Mesopotamia. In fact, there were two mass migrations. One went up to the Caucasus Mountains, came into Eastern Europe, ended up over on the British Isles. They were known as the Druids. And the primitive people who were there had worshipped them because they had knowledge, they knew things, they knew how to do things. And of course the other came into Egypt and from Egypt to Greece, from Greece to the Romans and then on into the Western civilization. In fact, the whole history of Western civilization has been one constant movement to the West. And when Europe filled up and the British Isles filled up, then they came to America and the East Coast filled up. And during the 1800s, it was one mass migration from the East Coast to the West Coast. And why? Why do these people keep moving? Historians, it's no mystery. They, they, they all say, they all admit why. To escape religious and political tyranny. In other words, in other words, somebody's been trying to get a hold of us all of this time, but we're like trying to grab mercury or something, you know, you're trying to grab it, well, move, <laughs> move some more. We just, had, but you know what, folks, we got a problem. There's no place else to move. And now they've got technology. And they know where everybody is. So here's just a brief rundown. You can see that you start with the ancient Samaria and you can trace the knowledge and the attempt to control humanity right on up. And it's all the same thing. The, the pharaohs, the Caesars, the royalty of Europe, Hitler, what were they concerned with? The bloodline and the interbred. And they want to maintain the purity of the blood. There's something about that and it tracks all the way back. So now, if we assume that these ancient t tablets are telling us the truth and that these spacefaring aliens landed on the planet all these thousands of years ago, then that begs the question. Did they all leave? Or did they all, or at least a portion of them, stay behind? It's an either-or thing. They either all left or, they, or some of them or all of them stayed behind. So which is it? I think we can find the answer. And we find the answer by looking at the historical record. If they all left, the whole written history of mankind should be just one unending, gradual evolution up to civilization. You know, hunter-gatherers to city-states to nations and on like that, with nothing in the record to show that there was anything strange or unusual going on. But that's not what we find, is it? Quite the contrary. The historical record gives us the answer. This is the great Los Angeles air raid. If you look closely, you can see the saucer caught in the, in the uh, searchlights. You've got pictures of saucers over the desert. You've got an ancient fringe coin from the 1600s that shows a giant wheel-shaped object floating over the countryside. You've got alien autopsy. You've got the triangles. You've got a Billy Mayer picture over here in the crop circles and, of course, the occult that's been with us all the time, which is just strangeness that nobody knew how else to explain. And of course, all of the sightings of UFOs, cattle mutilations, the whole thing. Somebody's still here. But if they're still here, then what's going on? I feel like there's three possibilities because we have clearly established that there is a small ruling elite that wants to rule the world. And we've also established that these ancient astronauts apparently are still around, at least some of them are. So this leads to three possibilities. Either the ruling elite are trying to contact these ancient creators, or number two, they've already contacted these ancient creators and are being controlled or guided by them, or number three, they are the ancient creators, the ancient serpent kings of legend the ones who have been trying to corral and control humanity from the get-go. And now they're getting close to realizing this because now they have the technology to do it. So now we have to ask ourselves, these people, these same bloodlines, these same people, the, what are the odds that the Bushes, who is the leader of the free world, and 
the Windsors, who are the lead, leaders of the, what's left of the British Empire, what's the odds that, that these, these two families that are blood related, so you're actually talking about one family, are, are running the, the Western civilization? What are the odds of that? More details in rule by secrecy, 